In this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about a study strategy that I switched to after my first year of medical school, which led to me getting a 4.0 the rest of the time and led to me being inducted into like the only two honor societies in medical school that actually matter. And that strategy is stop taking notes, seriously. For those of you that don't know me, my name is John. I'm a fourth year medical student. I just submitted my residency application, so, you know, say some prayers for me. I worked for a couple of the big name national MCAT companies before coming to medical school, and then I started this YouTube channel and this associated company, Informing Future Doctors, with the other tutor on the channel, uh, Maggie, who also happens to be my sister. So the reason that I stopped taking notes is because I started to reflect on like the advice I was giving to MCAT students and wondering how that could apply to my studies in medical school. Now, I was doing the whole classic, like I was going to lectures and I was taking notes that I thought were kind of like high yield or testable topics. And then I was really like diving deep into the PowerPoints and things like that. And I scored well my first year, but I think it was like a 3.5 or something like that. I ended up missing A's nearly in a couple of classes. And I just knew that I could adjust my study schedule and do better in my second, third, fourth years. So the framework that I decided upon, what I wanna lay out for you is that rather than focusing on like writing notes and memorizing to regurgitate on the test, you need to focus on three things. This three-step approach. Master the concepts, memorize the details, practice the application. Let's talk about mastering the concepts first. So what mastering the concepts means to me is like I want to have a large view, like an overall understanding of what we're talking about, whether that be, you know, like a biochemistry topic or whether that be a specific disease process or like the way that a drug works or something like that. So I did this in three steps. I would actually pre-read for my classes. So if, you know, most, most syllabi will give you like what the lecture topic is gonna be on. I know in med school, sometimes it would change, but regardless, I would skim that chapter or those few pages. It's usually not a ton per lecture. And I would only allow myself to spend like 20 minutes on it. So I'd skim the book. I'd do the same with the PowerPoint, kind of skim it. And then any like third party resources, I would do the exact same thing for. So for me in medical school, like the biggest third party resource I used was uh, called Pathoma. And you can essentially imagine that it's like what IFD does, but for medical school. So it's like all the high yield concepts, they have an associated book and associated lectures. So I would watch that lecture on like two times speed. I would skim through the chapter. I would go to the lecture. And it sounds like a lot, but I think all in all, it only took me like 45 minutes per lecture and it was the majority of my studying. So to master the concepts, I'd pre-read and then when you go to lecture, now that you've got a good foundation and base of knowledge, then you can actually interact with the lecture. Now I'm not necessarily meaning that you have to raise your hands and ask questions, which I would recommend, you know, if you don't know something and it's, it's a good way to force Sitting in the front row is a good way to force this upon yourself. But what I do mean that everybody should do, if you're not bold enough to ask a question, is ask yourself these four questions as you are going through lectures. So ask yourself, what's the big picture of this? You know, your lecturers are going to be PhD candidates and they're gonna sprinkle in a little bit of what they're interested in. But you need to understand, like if you're having a lecture about heart failure, and they're going into all these weird like exons or whatever the heck they go into, um, you need to understand like what is heart failure? Heart's not pumping enough, right? Like what's the big picture? Heart's not pumping enough. Why is heart not pumping enough? And the next thing I'd ask myself is like, how could this be tested? Now, a lot of times what you'll do is you'll find these like unique details in the PowerPoint. You're like, ooh, that's something that's gonna be tested. And you just have to kind of get a feel for that. But asking yourself and specifically looking for how this could be tested is very, very important, both in medical school and in uh, your pre-med curriculum, which you're probably going through right now. The third thing I would ask myself is, what does this look similar to? Now, the reason that I'm concerned about like, what does this look similar to, or how could I get confused on this, which is the fourth question I would ask myself, is because those two questions, the answers to those two questions are generally the incorrect answer choices. So that way you can already identify some of like the, like the trick questions they're gonna ask you, some of the easy stumbling blocks, but the bonus to that is that you start building these connections in your head. Like if you are in physics, for example, and you have a lesson on like circuits and they bring up Ohm's law, you see V is equal to IR, you, they start learning a little bit about um, how current is the flow of electrons and then you've got voltage and like you kind of, a lot of teachers will draw this relationship to like pressure and 
then they'll discuss like resistance and things of that nature. Well, you can probably say, oh, well, V equals IR is very similar to pressure is equal to flow times total resistance. So now you've already got that kind of built up in your head. Those connections will really come in handy in the MCAT. That's actually like a lot of what we teach in our high yield courses. And that's a lot of what's tested on the MCAT is like those nuanced connections and how the sciences relate to each other. But what they're gonna do is it's gonna allow you to have a bigger overall understanding and a deeper understanding of the concepts. If you understand the concepts, then the details usually aren't that hard to memorize. Which brings me to the next step, memorizing the details. Now I'll list two ways to memorize the details. I only used one of them. I only think you need one of them, but some people hate the first option, which I use, which that is flashcards. I used Anki, it's an electronic flashcard app. It has like this algorithm that allows you to utilize space repetition, active recall, it combats memory decay, the whole nine yards. I've got a ton of videos on Anki on our YouTube channel if you're interested in that. And our high yield course actually comes with like a little mini course of me walking through Anki as well. So some little caveats for lecture is pre-made decks are great and that's what I prefer because they save you so much time for making your own cards. But you do need to add in your own cards from like those details that you are sitting in lecture like oh like that's that's something that's like very easy to forget but the lecture Put a lot of emphasis on that so that's probably going to be tested so use a pre-med deck and then add in your own little details or like practice questions that you've missed especially if you're studying for the mcat things like that and anki will absolutely cover all of your memorizing for you but some people hate anki and so what i've seen a lot of students do what i've tried myself i've actually worked well for me in physiology in undergraduate was summary sheets so making little summary sheets of you know everything that's in your lecture condensing that down to something that you can read over quickly. A lot of people like that. My personal opinion is that it's a little bit too time consuming. Sometimes it can be a little bit more fun. You know, it's pretty rewarding to like have like an entire lecture on one page and be able to uh, reference it quickly, but it's a little bit too time consuming. And I also worry that if you're focusing on writing too much, then you aren't focusing on understanding the concept or those individual details. You're just trying to like memorize that as a chunk which really isn't too much different from flipping through PowerPoints a dozen times. And I know that that works for you. I know that you've probably got your 3.0 or your 4.0 by memorizing PowerPoints, but I'm here to tell you it will not work for the MCAT. There's too much to memorize. And medical school is even more so. You know, the Anki deck that I use for medical school is like 32,000 cards. Compare that with like most MCAT decks are 3,000. So there's just so, so much to memorize in medical school that those summary sheets are gonna be a little bit outdated. They're gonna be a little bit too time consuming for you. So make it easier on yourself. Go ahead and establish those good habits early. The last step to my study approach that I switched to that helped me score excellent in medical school is practicing the application of the topics. Now the best way to do that is to take practice questions with meaningful review. Okay, so any practice questions you can get your hands on. If you can get your hands on old tests that were written by the same professor, that's a great idea to practice. If you can get your hands on old tests that weren't written by the same professor but are on the same topics, that's also a great way to practice. The goal here is not to memorize questions and hope that they pop up on the exam, although it's pretty sweet when they do, but the goal here is to test if your understanding of the concepts is deep enough to apply it to get questions correct. It's not to test how well you've memorized, it's to test if you've got the concepts properly understood. Now, most like medical schools and, and a lot of undergraduates, it's difficult to get your hands on an old test, um, especially if you're not like in a fraternity or something like I wasn't. And so, I use third-party resources all throughout medical school. The one that I used was UWorld. And it's the one that most medical students will use to prep for like their board exams or like your licensing exams, like step one, step two. And it's becoming like ridiculously popular in the MCAT realm as well. It's one of the reasons that um, us at IFD, we've got that partnership collaboration with UWorld to where you can actually use our high yield course where you get the books and the lectures to understand the concepts and how they're applied and then go to UWorld itself and they allowed us to select, comb through all 3,000 of their questions and select the questions that were appropriate for each topic. So if you're studying for biochemistry, but you're also wanting to take the MCAT soon, it's probably not a bad idea to be able to look through 
our guide and watch our lecture like I did with uh, the Pathoma, the third party resource for the step exams in medical school and understand the big concepts that are tested on those licensing exams. Pair that with the learning that you've done in lecture and then practice that on UWorld, uh, which are MCAT related questions. And then using our course, you know, you can hand select the questions that you want. So it's not a bad option. It's not what you have to do. It's not even what this video is about, right? This video is about taking notes is time consuming and it promotes very shallow learning. And to combat that shallow learning, you have to be very intentional with your learning. Because I mean, after all, like you're here for a reason and it doesn't feel like that. I know it feels like this is just something you have to do, but I really, really encourage you to be more active in your education and to kind of take ownership of it. Because play this out, you know, both directions. Say you work really, really hard and you, maybe you make the financial investments and whatever resources that you need and you score higher than you even needed to. Like, are you really going to look back and be like, man, I really wish that like I had gone out with the boys more. Or are you going to look back and be like, I did it. Like, I didn't want to, but I did it and I'm proud of myself. It's probably going to be that one, right? Or let's reverse it and say that you had all these fun life experiences, but you let your grades slip a little bit and you were like me and you kind of just fooled around when you're studying for the MCAT instead of really taking it seriously because it's a beast of a test. And now here you are, two years later, two years after you graduated from undergrad, you've got a physics and a biology major and you were sitting there grooming tennis courts because that's the only person that will hire you. That was me. You know, if I have the option to spend my 20s working really hard or to spend my 20s enjoying life and then my 30s living with regret over the fact that I was like too short-sighted, you know, it's kind of like lines up this paradigm. When you're 30 years old, you can either be underskilled and overlived or you can be underlived and overskilled. I would rather pick the overskilled person that's accomplished what you wanted to accomplish when you were 30 and now you can focus on enjoying the things in life that actually matter because I never ever want to look back on college and be like, that was the best days of my life. It doesn't have to be. And in continuing with my just like free advice that you didn't ask for, but you're gonna get, I know that I'm like pushing you hard to work really hard and I always do. And that's because like my favorite thing in life is seeing people with potential meet that potential. That's my favorite thing to do in life. Like I did really, really well in medical school and it felt good, but it just kind of felt like I did what I should have done. But whenever you all email me, you know, I just got an email from uh, Jason, one from Emily. We got a, I got a discord message from Sarah and you're telling me like, hey, you took the high yield course, you took it seriously, you scored exceptionally well and now you're getting ready to interview for medical school and you feel confident. That fills me with so much more joy than my own accomplishments. So I know that I push you hard. I wanna give you a little bit of nicer advice and that's that you should take breaks when you're studying. You know, you don't wanna run yourself ragged. You don't wanna sacrifice your mental health. But to make sure that those breaks are useful, try taking timed breaks when you're studying. You know, carve out time for things. Just say, I'm gonna study for, between going to class and studying today, it's gonna to take me 10 hours. And whenever I have that like four hour uninterrupted time of studying, I'm not gonna check my phone a ton. I'm going to study for 50 minutes and then take 10 minute breaks. I can do whatever the heck I want to in those 10 minutes, but like that's my study time. And like that's the, that's the time I invest in myself for my future. And everybody has that time. You know, you may be exceptionally busy. I, I have no doubt that some of you are more busy than I was. Um, you may even be more busy than I am now, but most people have like the hours of 5 a.m. to 9, p uh, 9 a.m. Or maybe you have the hours of like 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Whatever you have, carve that out and protect your future, okay? Because that is something, you wanna talk about sacrificing your mental health. Don't be a person that, you know, all those people that you've met that said, I wanted to be a doctor and now they're not and they look unsatisfied. Don't be one of those people Okay, do the work now. And my favorite way to do this work is to wake up early and eat the frog. That's two things that I hate to do, right? So I don't really enjoy waking up early. You get to a point where you appreciate it, but waking up early is just, you know, most of the times the hardest thing that you do the whole day is get out of the bed. It's warm in there. You know, you may have your significant other there with you and you don't wanna get up early. You just want to continue to rest. But if you can wake up early, then you've usually accomplished like the hardest thing you're going to do all day. And then you can use that time to focus on improving in your future. So if you're studying for the MCAT alongside, you know, studying for your 
coursework then yeah wake up at five and study you know if you if you got the maybe you've got the IFD high yield course or our ebooks or something like that wake up at five and spend two hours working through that or working some euro questions or something of that nature or heck maybe you're a person like me you also have like an entrepreneurial spirit like wake up at five and work for two hours on your business protect that time and the second part of that quote is eat the frog now that comes from a book of which I'm blanking on the title right now but basically the premise is if you knew that you could have the life you wanted to but every single day you had to eat a frog when would you eat the frog like that's going to be the worst part of your day every day right and so the premise that the book came to or the conclusion the book came to was that it's best to just eat the frog first thing because that way you had the worst part of your day over and you can enjoy the rest of your life the rest of your day juxtaposed to like putting it off all day and worrying like uh, i know i have to eventually eat this frog and it kind of ruins your whole day and i think that studying is the same w way with that and for me the worst part of my day was Anki. You know, it took several hours every single day. And that was because I had a ton of cards in med school. But for the MCAT, it'll probably take you like 30 to an hour, 30 minutes to an hour. So that's might be the worst part of your day, the most boring, but it's also vital to your success. So that's it. That's how I studied in med school. I was very consistent with it. I sacrificed a lot for it, but I'm, I'm happy, you know, the metrics that I have. And, you know, I can feel confident applying to a very competitive residency. And I know that I may not match, I may not get accepted into that residency, but it's not because of my coursework, because I did the job there. I know you can too. Thanks for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.